So, all right, today we are going to just slow things down a bit. Last time we saw calculus, right? And hopefully you've been working on this pre-final enough that you can see, okay, the stuff I did there is relevant to the pre-final. And that's what we're aiming towards learning is all these things, but we want to learn it a little more precisely, a little more in depth, so we really, really understand it. So at the end, when I give you the real final, it's like this is a piece of cake. Okay. Now, before we jump into the heavy stuff, I want to make sure that everybody is roughly on the same page when it comes to the basics. So today, our goal is to talk about functions. graphs of functions, and more to the point, analytic geometry. I get scared when I hear the word geometry, but I feel better when I see analytic because that means that there's numbers. I know what those are. Okay, so that's what we're going to try to get through today. Uh, tomorrow, we're going to try to do trigonometry and exponential functions. Okay. And that will more or less, and in logarithmic functions, so that will more or less be the end of our review. And so on Thursday, we're going to get into limits, which is where calculus really begins. Okay. So the first couple days, just going to be review. We're going to take it easy. We're going to ease ourselves into it. So let's start with functions. Right. But to talk about functions, we first want to talk about sex a little bit. Now, set theory is this huge, enormous, beautiful, crazy theory. We don't have time to talk about it because it's calculus class. So I'll just give a very basic definition. So I use defin or definition. Short. Okay. And this is going to be a very naive definition, and we won't need it a whole lot. That's why we do it naively. A set. is a collection of points. OK, what do I mean by a point? Okay. What do I mean by a point? Well, I don't want to tell you what I mean by a point in this general definition. Point could be anything. Could be numbers. Just could be some weird object. Could be chairs, TVs, you. It doesn't really matter. Just points. So I leave this as an undefined term. All right. Now, in this class, this point is always going to be numbers, right? typically real numbers. But it's just some collection. So you think about it just some collection of points. So for example, right? okay, I, I have a set, I'm going to call it A. And I denote the elements of the set with uh, these curly braces. And say it could be 1, 2, 3, A, and a square, or something resembling a square. Another example is going to be on the real number line. All right, maybe I will take all the points between minus 4 and 2, where I include the number 2, but I don't include the number minus 4. And as we talked about in the recitation yesterday, this set is going to be denoted by minus 4, 2 where I put a parenthesis around the minus 4 to denote I don't include it, and I put a square bracket around the 2 to denote that I do include it. Okay. Another way you might write this is with, if you want to use curly braces, the set of all x in the real numbers, such that minus 4 is less than x, and x is less than or equal to 2. So these are equivalent ways of writing this set. That's the set I'm talking about. OK, now, if, on the other hand, I want to denote, say, all the numbers bigger than 1, not including 1, right? just everything bigger, the way I'm going to denote that is either with what's called interval notation, 1 to infinity. Right? And then I always use a parenthesis when an infinity is involved. Never 
close bracket, because infinity is not a real number. Right? So we can't include it. In set. Right? Or I can say the set of all x. Right? And since in this class we're always going to be talking about real numbers, I'll usually not write x is an element of a real of a set of real numbers. Right? I'll just write x. So all x such that x is greater than one means the same thing. I guess I should write four in both places. Okay, so this is a set. What kind of questions? Is this clear? The interval notation, maybe you've seen this. We talked about it in the recitation yesterday. It's in good shape. Uh, let me just give you one more example, just in case you forgot it from yesterday. Uh, let's say I'm going to have two intervals that are going to make up my set. Uh, say this will be minus 2 to minus 1, and say this will be 1 to 3. Okay, so I want these two intervals to both be in my set. And the way I'm going to do it is using, with this interval notation, is to write a, a union. So first I write down this interval, minus 2 to minus 1, I include both endpoints. Then I do a U, right? It's kind of a funny U, it looks like a little cup. That's for union. And then I write one to three, right? Where I don't include the one and I include the three. And if I wanted to write it using this set notation, well, I'd say all x such that minus two is less than or equal to x, less than or equal to minus one, right? Or uh, 1 is less than x is less than or equal to 3. Alternatively, I can write it as the union of two sets written this way. So all x such that x is between here, right? close brace, union, all x such that x is between here. Close brace. So two different ways to write it. Both are fine. I know what you mean. Just make sure you do. Okay, so but we want to talk about functions. Why do we want to talk about functions? Well, in modern mathematics, a major discovery was made on a conceptual level. And that discovery was that you have these objects, right? These sets. Right? And there's other mathematical objects right, called groups and vector spaces. And if you go higher in math, there's all sorts of fun ones. But what's really important is not necessarily those objects, but maps between those objects. In fact, this whole course, right, is about functions, about derivatives of functions, right? And of course, functions are, are maps between things. That's what we're going to get to. Right? And the, the whole class is just a study of those things. We're not studying the sets themselves. We're not studying the real numbers themselves. We're actually studying maps between the real numbers and themselves. Okay? So it turns out that the maps are more important than the objects you're studying. So let's, let's define this a little more precisely. So... Definition of function f from a set A to a set B is a rule. That assigns to every x and a. Okay, so uh, I used this notation already, but maybe you don't, you don't know this notation. When I use this funny looking E, right, this means is an element of. Okay, so the points of a set are also called elements of the set. Okay, so if I go back to this definition, I might write is a collection of points or elements. Okay, again, elements like points, I believe, is an undefined term. Okay, so a function from A to B is a rule that assigns to every x, which is an element of A, a unique element down here called f of x, which is an element of B. So I have two sets, A and B. I draw a picture for you, maybe. So I 
I have A, I have B, and let me put in some objects in here, some points, some elements, right. and then over here I'm going to put some more points. And F is going to be a rule, which is going to take, say, this point, and it has to send it to a unique element over here. So if I called this point little a and this point little b, then I would say, this is my function is f, f of a is equal to b. Okay. Now I take this point over here, and I'll send it there. And this point I'm going to send to b also. And this one I send here, and this one I'll send here. Okay, okay so this is a rule. If I start with some point over here, I give it a unique point over there. Right? I can't have it where I go like that. Okay? I can't have two arrows coming out of the same point. Okay? If, it, if you do it, it's not a function. Okay? So I can't have that. Okay? On the other hand, what I can have is two arrows going into the same point. That's okay. And you'll notice over here that I have some point which doesn't get hit at all. That's okay too. The only rule for it to be a function is that a point can only have one arrow coming out of it. Okay? Now, if, however, if for, well, let me write it, with, I'll write it not in math language, let's write it. If uh, no two arrows go to the same point. We call f a one to one function. So this is not a one to one function because this arrow and this arrow go to the same point. And if every element in B has an arrow going to it, we call F an onto function. And so this is not an onto function because there's a point which doesn't have an arrow going to it. And if you're in the really special case, where your function is both one to one and onto, then you give another special name. So if f is, well, okay, I write one, two, one. I don't like this, but normally I just write one to one with a, with a n number, right? So f is one to one. It means the same thing. f is one to one and one to. We call f a bijection. Or inverse. Either one. So we're going to be interested in all sorts of functions. Some of them are going to be one-to-one, -one, some are going to be onto, some will be bijections. Uh, also, if you've taken a class before where you've seen this, you may have also seen the uh, terminology one-to-one -one correspondence. So that's also used if it's a bijection, so one-to-one -one correspondence. But I don't like this very, very long. Okay, so, good. So this is what we're talking about in this course, is functions that look like this. And every once in a while, we're going to start talking about these properties. So I, I want you to know them. And, well, I just want to give you a flavor of a discussion we're going to have later on, which is following. Uh, let's say that you were a sheep herder. I don't know why you're at Suffolk University, but you're a sheep herder. 
and you want to know how many sheep you have. Right? And it's not so many. Maybe there's 20, but you don't know it's 20. So what do you do? You go out and you go one, two, three, four. Okay, do this. But now let's say you don't know how to count. Right? You've never learned how to count. How would you determine how many sheep you have? Right? Well, if you don't know how to count, it doesn't make any sense to say, I have this many sheep, right? It's silly. But let's say you don't actually care how many sheep you have, as long as every day when you bring all the sheep back in from rowing out on the plane, you have the same number of sheep as you had yesterday. How could you do that? How could you make sure you, you have that? Ideas. You can't count. Right? And there's too many, you know, you've got shoes on, so you can't see your toes so well. Right? Do you know the alphabet? Do I know the alphabet? Okay, I don't know the alphabet either. But that's not a bad idea. I don't know the alphabet. In fact, I know no nice ordered set of songs. But we don't need that. What can I do? Well, um, I mean, if you didn't know how to count, but you just had, you mean, you, there were not so many things. Right? And I wanted to make sure I had the same number all the time. Let's say there was only like three. Could you do it with your hand? How would you do it? Well, you say, okay, look, uh, okay, there's this one, that one, and that one. Okay, and then the next day you come back and you go, okay, there's this one, that one, and that one. And you, oh, okay, I have the same number. And if the next day you go, there's this one, and that uh oh, I'm missing one. Now, you don't know how to count, but you certainly know how to match up. Okay. So, okay, if you had 20 or say 30, right, so more than your hands and toes to allow, you still, what you could do is you know, get a bag of rocks. Right? And every, for every sheep, you put a rock into the bag. Okay, now the sheep all go out, you pour your rocks. As they come back in, put a rock into the bag. If there's any rocks left over, you know you're missing a sheep, right? You go find both feet. Both feet? Okay. Now, what happens if you put all the rocks in and there's more sheep. Well, then you know a uh, little hanky-panky was going on behind your back, right? Okay, so, so there's a way, though, of counting things without actually using numbers, right? Without actually knowing how many there are. And what you're actually doing is building a bijection, right? Between the number of rocks and the number of sheep. You're building a map. You're saying, okay, this rock corresponds to this sheep. Now, of course, you don't really care I mean, the rocks are all the same, pretty much, and the sheep are all the same. You don't care which one really corresponds, but you'd say there is some map that corresponds. Okay. So this is actually a way that we can talk about size of sets without talking about numbers. And if we have some time later on, I want to extend this to talk about sizes of infinite sets. And I want to show you that there are different sizes of infinity. There's not just the one size of infinity. There's actually multiple ones. So it's something that we try to get into later on when we have some time. All right, but for today, let's just say that these bijections are really interesting ideas, and functions in general are what make the whole course work. All right, now, typically, we're not going to look at functions that are this simple. All right, this is just a function on a finite set going to a finite set. We're usually going to be talking about functions which eat all real numbers. Or, or maybe not all, maybe they miss a couple, or only they miss the negatives, or something like that. And they're going to spit out things which you know, are infinite in sense. Maybe all real numbers, or some subset of real numbers. Okay. And a good way to keep track of that is going to be with graphs. So let's talk about graphs. So graphs. A graph... Right, well, this is definitely not a precise definition, but uh, a graph this will be our first definition is a vis visual representation of a function. Okay, that's what that's what we want it to be. It's a way of looking at the function all at once and saying, okay, I, I understand the function. Okay, but this is not a mathematical definition. This is a, a people definition, right? This is, this is how we can remember it. Okay, what's a more mathematical definition? Well, 
a graph is a collection. And this will be, when I say graph in this class, I'm always meaning a two dimensional graph, but for our purposes, that would be good to know. A graph is a collection of ordered pairs. A, B. So, now, there's a little bit of ambiguity because earlier on when I did interval notation, I also used this sort of thing. And I don't mean the same as interval notation. I really mean a pair of numbers, A and B. So sometimes they use different notation for that, but it's not very standard. It's a collection of ordered pairs where uh, well, in our class, we're always talking about real numbers. So I'm just going to say A and B are real numbers. Okay. Generally speaking, a graph of something, a function like this is you would have an ordered pair where the first component was an A, and the second component was a B. So it's just a collection of ordered pairs. But of course, as human beings, we don't want just a collection of ordered pairs. We want to be able to see it. Because I said, it's a visual representation of a function. Right? So what we do is we plot it. Right, in what is called R2, where we have a copy of the real number line, and we have another copy of the real number line. And if we pick a, if we have a function, say f, and I pick a point, say a, then I can apply the function f to a, and I get f of a. Right? And it will be some real number, and I plot that point on the graph. OK. Cool? So an example that you should already know about this. Actually, let's do a whole bunch of examples you should already know. Okay, let's do the function f of x eats x squared. Right? So in, in this section, right, all functions go from the real numbers to the real numbers. And I, or possibly some subset, if I need. Okay, so what does this graph look like? Well, for every point in the real numbers, we just graph what the corresponding point is. So for 0, well, f of 0 is 0. If you have 1, Right, f of 1 is 1. If you have 2, f of 2 is 4. And of course, we need to fill in all the points in between. And if you do, it looks something like that. And then we have to do it for the negatives. And you do this. OK, and we get a nice parabola. And that's what the graph of that function looks like. Right? But in essence, this graph is just a collection of ordered pairs. The ordered pairs look like 1, 1, 0, 0, minus 1, 1, minus 2, 4. Right? You just have the input value and the output value. OK, so these things just keep going up. Now, let's ask, is this function a 1 to 1 function, or an on to function, or a bijection? Well, let's see. If it's going to be a one-to-one -one function, all right, that means that you can't have two arrows going to the same thing. Okay? Or if you like, that means you can't have two x values going to the same y value. Right? This is what we call the x-axis, and that's the y-axis. Okay, so do we have two things going to the same value? Sure, right? How can you visualize that? Well, let's draw a little horizontal line. You can see the same value here is showing up there and there. Of course, any horizontal line up here will hit it at least twice. So it's not a one-to-one -one function. In particular, it's not a bijection. Right? Because it has to be one-to-one, -one, it's going to be a bijection. What about onto? Is it an onto function? What does onto mean? That means that every element in the image, right? So the image is on this axis. Every element has to be hit. Are there points that don't get hit? Sure. What's a, name me a point that doesn't get hit. Zero, negative one. Okay. Y equals minus one. This is not hit by the graph. 
Again, the hor this horizontal line will tell you. If you draw horizontal lines, it doesn't hit it anywhere. And this is what's sometimes called the horizontal line test. You run all sorts of horizontal lines through the graph. If it hits it no times, then the function is not onto it. If it hits it always one time, then the function is a bijection. And if it hits it more than one time at some point, then it's not one to one. Okay? So that's the more general version of the horizontal line test. Okay, so these are parabolas. Very nice to know. Let's do another one. How about f of x equals x cubed? It's more complicated. All right, so let's plug in a few points just to make sure we know what it's going to look like. So of course, if you put in 0, you get 0. So that's a point on the graph. Okay, if you put in 1, you get 1. So far, it's looking the same. Plug in 2, you go all the way up here to get 8. Now already I can't graph 2 anymore because the board doesn't go high enough. I'm not tall enough to even fit. Right, well, so let's go the other way. If I put in minus 1, what do I get? I get minus 1, right? Minus 1 cubed is minus 1. And if I put in minus 2, I'm going to get minus 8. So let's see here. So minus 1 gives me minus 1, and minus, uh, minus 2 is going to go all the way down here, give me minus 8. Okay. And if you plot this all in, it's going to end up looking like that. It doesn't look very nice. Let's try to do that a little better. Still not great, but we're doing okay. Okay, so it's one of these deals. Now, actually, the graph is really bad. Once we learn a little calculus, all right, we're going to be able to prove that this graph is bad. And the reason why is because in calculus, remember what we talked about last time, is all about finding the slope of tangent lines to curves. Right? And it's going to turn out that the slope of the tangent line at zero is going to be zero. Which means that this should actually flatten out right here. Right at zero, it should be flat. That's what a zero slope is. It's a flat line. So this really should flatten out quite a bit. But we'll get to that. Okay, so there's a nice graph. Make sure you, you know this. Let's do some more graphs. I just want to give you a whole bunch of graphs that you need to know in this course. Okay, so how about uh, y equals the square root of x? Okay, so this time, I already say f of x. This time we no longer have a function from the real numbers to the real numbers. Why not? Because you get negatives, right? I cannot stick negative real numbers in here. So this is really only a function from the positive or zero, I also call the non negative real numbers. And what kind of numbers are spit out? They're always positive, right? By definition, this symbol means we only look at positive square roots. Because right? if you take, say, the number 4, and you say, what's the square root? Okay, well, that, that should be a question that's saying, what number, when you square it, do you get 4? And of course, there's 2, but there's another one. Minus 2, exactly. Okay? So this symbol says, only take the positive one. That's the convention. It's just a convention. You could say you always take the negative one, but we always mean positive. Okay, so this is actually a function between those two sets. And what does the graph look like? Well, again, you have 0, 0. If you have 1, you have 1. So everything looks the same. All right, but then you get 2, and now you're going to get square root of 2, which is about 1.414. Right. Right. And then I'll skip, I guess I don't have to skip it, 3 is going to be about 
1.7, I think it's 1.732 or something, it's not so important. And then at 4, you get up to 2. Right, and it's going to keep going up, but it doesn't go very fast. Just kind of meanders its way up. Eventually going to infinity, but very slow. Okay. And it should be a little curvier than that, but just don't draw well. All right, now let's do one which you've probably seen before, but not so often, which is the absolute value function. So let's recall what this is. The absolute value takes a real number, and it, if it's positive, it does nothing to it. It just spits out the same number. And if it's negative, it just makes it positive. The way we write that mathematically is, well, if x is greater than 0, or equal to 0, we just spit back x. And if x is less than 0, well, how do you make a negative number positive? You make a negative of it. Right? The negative of a negative is a positive. So we put negative x. So really, this is just two separate functions that are glued together. It's called a piecewise function. So this is a piecewise defined function. Defined in pieces, right? In this case, two pieces. What's the graph look like? Well, let's see. If we put in zero, we again get zero. If we put in one, we get one. If we put in two, we get two. If we put in three, we get three. All right, it's very boring on the on this side. It's just the line y equals x on that side. Just keep going up. And on the other side, if I put in a minus 1, well, this says if it's negative, then you have to put the negative in front of it and make a positive, so it becomes 1. Right? And if you get a minus 2, it's going to become 2. If you get a minus 3, it's going to become 3. Right? So it's just the line y equals minus x on this side. So it looks like a v. Now, an interesting question, which we're going to touch on later, is okay, the slope of the tangent line to these curves is right very easy to compute, because these are straight lines. Over here, it's 1. Over here, it's minus 1. Okay? But we want to know what the slope of the tangent line at 0 is, right, at this little v. Right? And this is going to be one of the first places we're going to see the calculus has a lot of trouble. Right? It's not going to know what to do with itself. Any questions on how to graph these things? I mean, this is all stuff I assume you've seen before and you just assume be sleeping right now. So if you have questions, please let me know so we can try to answer them. Okay, let's do uh, an exponential function. So uh, how about f of x? Well, it's just used my favorite, e to the x. Okay, so again, what values can I stick in for x here? Everything. So this is again, we're back to the case, just like in the absolute value, right? We'll give a real function, going to a real function, although we're going to see you're not going to be able to get all real numbers. So let's see, what does this do? Well, this takes, say, 0. Ah, we finally get one where it's not 1. I mean, it's not 0. Right, you put in 0 up here, you get e to the 0. Of course, if you raise it something to the 0 power, you get 1. Right, so you get that point. If we put in a 1, well, you're going to get e to the 1, which is e. Right, and e is roughly 2.71828. So that's going to go there. Okay, and then it just starts blowing up. It goes really high. You can't draw that on. And then on this side, well, let's see, you're going to get 1 over e. So that's a little more than a third. 
And then when you go 2, minus 2, well, boy, it's, it's starting to get really small. But here's the thing. As it gets really, really small, you can't ever take some positive number and raise it to a power and get 0. Or even better, you can't get anything negative. So this thing's going to keep getting smaller, but it's never going to quite hit 0. All right, and then it blows up. That's exponential growth. Okay, and then it gets really, really small, but it never quite hits it. Okay, and anybody remember what it's called when you, you approach some number right, as you go to infinity, what that's called? It's like a limit, but let's, let's not use the word limit at this point. Asymptote? Almost the correct pronunciation, but the uh, right idea is an asymptote. That's right. We, no, we swear. Okay. Okay. Asymptote. Okay, which, so this here, right, as it approaches zero, this graph has a horizontal asymptote. And we'll go back to this topic when we do limit. As a horizontal asymptote, that means there's some line that it's approaching as it goes to infinity. Incidentally, asymptote does not mean that it can't touch that line ever just means, well, to actually be careful, we have to use the word limit to say what it means. So uh, the asymptote incidentally here is y equals zero. So, and of course, if you replace e with your, you know, your favorite positive number, then, well, the graph basically looks the same. You just have to adjust you know, the height of these things a little bit. But it's the same graph. Okay, what about the inverse function? So, let's, you'll notice that this e to the x, right, if we draw horizontal lines, it's only going to hit the graph once, at least up here. Down here, it's going to hit it no times. So, strictly speaking, it's not a bijection because it's not one to, but it is one to one. And one nice thing about one to one functions is that as long as you restrict the image, you can invert it. So if we only look at numbers that are greater than zero as my image, then this is a bijection, right? Because now everything in the image is hit, right? Every positive number, there is something that's going to hit, which means we have an inverse function. Okay, and an inverse function is just a function which swaps the x and the y's. Right? So every time you have a number here, you have a new function going backwards, which takes this number and spits out the, the corresponding value. So for instance, the inverse function here at e is going to send e to 1. Whereas this function took 1 to e, the inverse function takes e to 1. All right? This function took 2 to e squared. The inverse function takes e squared to 2. All right? And the way we write that inverse function is with the logarithm. All right? The logarithm is the inverse function of the exponential. So if we have f of x equals the natural log of x, right? Of course, if I change from e to 5, then I have to change ln to log base 5. So this I view as a function from the positive numbers right, to the reals, right? This one from the reals to the positive. This one has to go from the positives to the reals. And what does the graph look like? Well, all you do if you want to know the graph of an inverse function is you take the original function and draw in the line y equals x. Okay? And you pretend it's a mirror. And you say, okay, what would happen if you took the mirror image? Right? You reflect it across. And whatever you get, that's what the inverse function's graph is going to be. Right? So we just take all these points and just shoot them across. And if we do that, we're going to see it's going to look like this. So for instance, a horizontal asymptote turned into a vertical asymptote. And so this here, this is a vertical asymptote. Which is x equals 0. Okay. And let's see, we have a point here. So this was 0, 1. That's going to turn around and become 1, 0. So that's where it's crossing. That's 
at 1. And if I put in E, that better spit out 1, because this one took 1 and gave me E. So this one better take E and give me 1. And if I have here E squared, that better give me 2. So that's the graph of the logarithm, which is really nice because, boom, we have our inverse graph. Okay. Let's do sine function. Okay, of course, we're going to talk about these exponential functions more, or maybe less, and sine uh, and the same with these trig functions tomorrow. But I at least want to graph this. Uh, so that even if you don't know what sine is, you know what it looks like. Okay, so what does sine do? Well, let's see, it starts at 0, 0, and then we're going to put in some typical values that help you plot it. Pi over 2, pi, 3 pi over 2, 2 pi. Incidentally, this is a good time to mention, uh, with a few exceptions, we are not going to talk about degrees in this class. It's always going to be in radians. Right? So a circle does not have 360 degrees for us, it has 2 pi radians. We just, you know, you're, I'm not going to say sine 30 degrees very often. It's always going to be sine of pi over 6. So make sure you understand how to translate in your head between degrees and radians, and eventually just forget about degrees and think of radians. This is really the language of mathematics. Okay, so let's see. Uh, at 0, we get 0. At pi over 2, we get 1. At pi, we get 0. At pi, 3 pi over 2, we get minus 1. At 2 pi, we get 0. So it's going to look like this. And of course, it just goes on forever in the same pattern. Beautiful sine function. That's what your voice looks like. At least on an oscilloscope. Okay. Now what's this? Well, this is it's a function which can eat any real number. And strictly speaking, it you know you can put it going into the set of real numbers, but in fact, you can see the the output is always between minus one and one. So if we want to make it an on two function. We can send it to the interval minus 1, 1. Okay, and now it's an on two function. Is it a 1 to 1 function? No. Why? Well, let's draw some horizontal lines. Does it hit it more than once? <laughs> Boy, it hits it quite a bit. Okay. Infinitely many times, in fact. So, well, we'll talk, maybe tomorrow we'll talk a little bit about how to turn this into a one-to-one -one function by restricting the domain further so that you can get an, an infertile, yeah, to get an inverse, which is usually called arc sine. Okay, now if I wanted to do the graph of cosine, what do I do? Well, I just pick up sine and I shift it over. So this point here should go over there, so I need to pick it up and shift it over by pi over 2. Okay, so all points move, just get up and do that. Okay, there's your graphic cosine. Right, that's not bad. And then let me just show you the graphic tangent, because that's a handy one to have. in the recitation that tangent has problems. Why does it have problems? Well, recall tangent is sine over cosine. So what's the problem? You get zeros in the denominator, right? This cosine can be zero. So you have to exclude everywhere where cosine of x is zero. And we saw exactly what that set was yesterday. And uh, I hope you went home and 
thought about why that set I showed you was correct. Uh, so the set of all x, uh, well actually I guess, what did we say? It was the set of all things in the form uh, pi over 2 plus k pi, where k is an integer. Right? So integers, right? That's the set of things 0, minus 1, 1, minus 2, 2, minus 3, 3. So we're not allowed to put those in. At those points, we end up with asymptotes. Okay. In almost every case, when you have a zero in the denominator, it's going to give you a vertical asymptote. Again, we'll define that properly later. put in all these places where it's not defined. And then the way it always looks is, it, well, it kind of looks like x cubed, but it's a little different. Can't quite be x cubed, but it looks a lot like it. And it just repeats the same pattern. And I'm not being terribly careful about where I'm putting my points. What I want you to, to memorize is not the points on all these graphs. What I want you to memorize is the shape of the graphs. Right, so when I say tangent, you can immediately in your mind see what the graph looks like. I say the square root of x, it immediately pops into your head. You're like one of those programs, Mathematica or Maple or something. You just immediately pops in there. Okay. Okay, so this is a good collection of graphs. If I think of more over the course of the term, I'm sure I'll tell you. But this is a good one. These are good ones to remember so that they can immediately pop up. Make sure you have those memorized. You're going to use them all the time. All right. Now, I just want to very quickly go through and talk about translation of graphs. And, and all sorts of, uh, what are they called? Transformations of graphs. So uh, graph transformations. So it could be the case that you have something like this. For example, you'd have some function which is x plus 2 squared. Okay, and you want to know how to graph that. Well, when you do that, the important thing is to identify what's kind of the base function. In this case, you're really looking at x squared. All right, and you've just transformed it by adding a little plus on the inside. And then you have to remember what those transformations do. Right? So if you add some a where, let's say, uh, if a is greater than 0, right, then this shifts the graph to the left by a. So if I have x plus 2 squared, that means I pick up my graph and move it over by 2 to the left. So x plus 2 squared, what does that look like? Well, x squared is a parabola centered at 0. If it started at 0, it's got to move 2 to the left, 1, 2. And now I'm a parabola centered at minus 2. If a is less than 0, then it's going to shift the graph so to copy to the right by a. So uh, x minus 2 squared, right, I just shift it over to 2 and put the problem in. OK, very nice. That's easy to do. Right? The hard part sometimes is you know, figuring out that it looks like that, but you take a little, get a little practice with it. You can do it. And we're going to get practice. Okay. What about uh, 
if it's on the outside of the function. Okay. So for instance, if I have x squared plus 2. So this is different. This is no longer shifting it left and right. This is shifting it up and down. Okay. So if a is greater than 0, then you shift up by a. So this would become, right, you shift 1, 2. And of course, if a is less than 0, you shift down by a. Okay, so if you had x squared minus 2, it's down. So this is what I call a horizontal shift, and this is what I call a vertical shift. Right. Another thing you can do is instead of shift, you can reflect a graph. Start with a function, you can put a minus x. Right. Now, x squared is no longer going to be a good thing to do because if I did that, I don't change it. Uh, but let's say I did uh, e to the minus x. Okay. I've replaced my input with minus that input. What does that do? Right. Well, this reflects the graph around the y axis. Horizontally, I should say. Okay, so, for instance, remember, e to the x looks like this. If I reflect it, it's going to go the other way. And so, before it went like this, now it's going to shoot all the way down. Remember, the original one looked like. In this case, I'm reflecting it around the y-axis. Okay, another way you could reflect, of course, is vertically. Okay, you put the minus on the outside. So if I had minus e to the x. Right, and this will reflect the graph. Or uh, vertically. Okay, so we take the original graph and we're going to reflect it across the x axis. So now it's going to go graph. Just reflect it over. Okay, and then you can combine these things. Right? You have shifts. You have these reflections. What, you, what happens if you have both of them in the same thing? So what if we want to graph uh, f of x equals e to the minus x uh, Minus x plus 2. What do we have? Well, we have uh, a horizontal reflection built into it. Right? This is, if you think about it, if, uh, if f of x, in fact, let me, let me call this g of x. It makes it easier. So if f of x equals g of the x, then g of x is what? Well, it's f of minus x plus 2. And so what do I have in here? 
I have a horizontal reflection and a horizontal shift going on. Let me abbreviate horizontal reflection and a horizontal shift. Does it matter which one I do first? Yes or no? Who thinks yes? Who thinks no? All right, well, let's see. Let's take e to the x and let's do a reflection first. Okay, so e to the x looks like this. I reflect it. It now looks like this. And now I need to shift it. So it's a plus 2, so it's going to shift to the left. So before, it was hitting at 0, 1, but now it's going to have to shift over to the left by 2, and it's going to hit there. Okay, so that's if we do the horizontal reflection and then the horizontal shift. Let's do it the other way and see what happens. If we do the shift first, Okay, so now it, it's starting here, and I shift it over. Oh, I did. Yeah, I reflect. Good. Okay, so it's starting here, and I shift it over. So after the, the first shift, it's going to look like this. Now I need to reflect it. Okay, when I reflect it across this axis, where is it going to go? Okay, well, it's going to go over here. One, two. This point that was over here is now over here. So it's not in the right spot. So it certainly matters which one, right? This is we did horizontal shift and then horizontal reflection. It matters which one we do first. So what's the answer? Which one's the correct one to do first? The first one. The first one. Well, let's see. Uh, well, let's just try. Let's plug in a point. So if we plugged in minus 2 into our function, we would get e to the minus 2 plus 2, which is e to the 0, which is 1. So, oh, hey, we got 1. That's really, that's good. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry. That's a, that's a minus 2, right? So that's even worse. Minus Two, we put that in there, you get plus two. So you get two plus two is four. So you get e to the fourth. This is one, it's not e to the fourth. So this is not the right way to do it. Right. So this tells us that you have to do the horizontal shift first and the reflection second. All right? So somebody should come up with a, a good way to memorize that. I have one, but it's kind of dirty, so I can't say it on tape. How about you pause the tape? <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to embarrass anybody. Okay. Now, what about for verticals? Okay, we did horizontals. What about for verticals? Well, I won't uh, go through the same demonstration, but you'll be able to see with verticals shifts and reflections, it matters as well. And the answer is there, it's the opposite. You have to do vertical reflection first and the shift second. Again, a uh, little challenge, come up with some way of remembering these acronyms. Right? And I'll give a little prize if you come up with the best one. In fact, yeah, maybe I'll make up a little form and I'll send it out and you respond to it. And if you have the best one, you get a prize. I'll, I'll figure out what the prize is. Right? I'll just want to remember that. Alright. Uh, yeah, and it turns out that if you have horizontal and verticals, you can mix those freely. Those don't touch each other. And you can't hurt yourself by doing one first or the other. That's okay. Okay, uh, what was the last thing on my agenda? I said functions, graphs of functions, analytic geometry. Okay, so we won't be able to do much of that today. We only have a few minutes left here. What do we go to? Yeah, we have 10 more minutes. So let me just start it. We'll finish it tomorrow. And if you have a question you're afraid to ask it in class, just you know, send me an email, come to my office. I love to answer questions. It makes me feel smart. Okay, so let's do a little analytic geometry. So 
So in analytic geometry, well, this is first I should say, this is somehow opposed to what you might call synthetic geometry. Right, and this is when you took geometry in school and they, they gave you the axioms of Euclid and you built up all these nice theorems from the axioms. And anytime you wanted to prove things, you just went back to the axioms and kind of built it up from the theorems. That's kind of a pure, but also called synthetic geometry. Okay. Analytic geometry is where, well, for instance, when I draw a line, I'm not interested in, interested in it as just a line. I want to know points on the line, and when I say points, I want to know, you know, coordinates of that point. Okay? And when I want to find, you know, if I have another point, and I want to find the midpoint, I don't whip out my handy dandy, you know, compass and straight edge and start doing some weird elaborate construction to find the midpoint. I use the midpoint formula. Okay? That's what analytic geometry is all about. It's about taking you know, these pictures from geometry and incorporating tools from arithmetic and algebra. Okay. This field was really pioneered by uh, René Descartes, you know, the I think, therefore I am guy. Very smart guy. He's, that's why we first called these, the set of the Cartesian coordinate system after René Descartes. Isn't that Freud? Pardon? Isn't that Freud, Cogito Ergo Sum? That's right. Cogito Ergo Sum. I think therefore I am. Yeah. Yeah? yeah? No, I was asking, was it Freud the one who came up with that? No, no, that was not Freud. That was René Descartes, who lived significantly before Freud. Yeah, no, Freud, so this is uh, Freud said uh, a cigar is just a cigar. What's that? For it's supposed to be F-R-E-U. That, that's supposed to be a U. <laughs> yes. Sorry. Sigma fruit. Yeah. It's a, yeah, that, that's definitely a big part of that. I think they're for it. Okay. Uh, let's just see a little bit what we're talking about. So probably one of the most important aspects of analytic geometry we're going to deal with is related to the Pythagorean theorem. Okay. Recall what the Pythagorean theorem says. I'm sure you all call it. I just say that. If you have a right triangle, and I labeled the, the sides A and B in the hypotenuse C, okay, then there's a relation between the lengths of these sides, which is the square of one side plus the square of the other is equal to the square of the long hypotenuse. Yeah. Okay, so how does this get used? Well, we use it in forming what's known as the distance formula. Right? Which, says, which looks at the following. You have a, okay, a graph and you have two points. We call these x1, y1, and x2, y2. And I want to know the distance between these points. And by distance, I mean if I draw a straight line between them. Right? What is the length of this line segment between this point and this point? So that's what the distance formula aims to discover. And the way we're going to do it is just by using the Pythagorean theorem. So what we do is we draw line down until we get to the level of this point. Okay. What's the coordinate of this point down here? Well, let's see. The x tells you the horizontal, the y tells you, I'm sorry, the x, yeah, the x tells you how far you are this way, the y tells you how far you are this way. So what's the x coordinate of this? It's x2. And what's the y coordinate? Y1. Now we have this nice picture. If we want to know this distance, right? Well, the Pythagorean theorem tells you you only need to know the two side lengths, right? And not the hypotenuse, right? This is the hypotenuse of a right triangle. So I just need to know this distance and this distance. Okay, so 
So let me, let me give a name to these points. I'm going to call the second point Q and the first point P. And so I'll say the distance from P to Q. Well, we know that the square of that distance, on a, let me call this, how uh, about R. This distance squared is just this distance squared plus this distance squared. So I get, uh, let's see, PR, the distance from P to R squared plus the distance from Q to R squared. Okay. So this is just the distance from Q to R and the distance from P to R. You square them, add it up, you get this distance. That's Pythagorean theorem. Okay. But these distances are very easy to compute. Right. What is the distance from P to R? Well, all you're doing is changing the x value, right? The y stays the same, right? So you're just traveling this distance from x1 to x2, right? And the difference is, well, if you like, x2 minus x1, right? That was 2 and that was 5 and 5 minus 2. So you take uh, x2 minus x1 and you square it. And that gives you the distance from p to r squared. Okay? And how about q to r? Well. Here the x's stay the same, and the y's are different. You go from y1 up to y2. So know how far you went, you just do y2 minus y1. That's the rise. And of course, if you just want a formula without this square up here, you really want the distance, you have to take the square root of everything. So this implies distance from p to q equals the square root of x2 minus x1 squared plus y2 minus y1 squared. So this is very nice. Start with these coordinates, and you can figure out using this formula what the distance between these two points is. Okay. That's what analytic geometry is about. And we'll pick it up tomorrow and do a few more things. Uh, so we're going to keep going on the analytic geometry until we're, we've milked it. Okay, so look it up in the notes. He does things on the uh, distance formula, midpoint formula, equations of circles. Uh, we're going to skip ellipses and hyperbola until we, until we need them later. Uh, I want you to look up point slope form of a line, the slope of a line, slope intercept form of a line, all these things. That's what we're going to talk about. And then we're going to also talk about trig functions in a little more detail and maybe some exponential and logarithmic properties. Okay, so uh, we'll see you tomorrow.